is doing. Hallelujah. The prayer that changes destinies. The prayer that changes destinies. I want to talk to you about the realm of prayer. Because I believe right now we are in a season of prayer and intercession. Of course, prayer is one of the most foundational uh, aspects of our faith. One of the most foundational aspects of Christianity. But there's a right, wrong, right way to pray and there's a wrong way to pray. And today I want to talk about, you know, the right way to pray and the wrong way to pray. And, and you know what? People can say, how can there be a wrong way as long as you're genuine from your heart? Well, many people use prayer to self-impose themselves and to try to manipulate the hand of God and use it uh, kind of like a scapegoat, a form, a way out where it almost becomes witchcraft. It becomes carnal. So true prayer will change destinies. And a true life of prayer is poured out from the heart of God, not just from your heart, but from the heart of Jesus Christ, from the throne room, the throne realm of the Holy Ghost. So friends, let's continue to build up the atmosphere and build up the numbers here today. One of your favorite prophetic voices, Dr. Pastor Ben Lim is here. Hallelujah. And I cannot wait to get into this because let me ask you, is your prayer life effective? Are you being heard? Of course. The Bible is clear with many examples in scripture. Uh, that talks about your prayer being heard and God is a God who hears. However, the Bible is also clear in the book of Psalms that if your heart is filled with sin, then he will not hear you. He will not hear your prayers. He will not look towards you. So the Lord is not obligated to listen to every prayer nor even answer every prayer. And the key is for the Lord to answer, for his word to come upon us, for his life, his love, his breath to respond over our lives. Remember, the fire only falls when there's sacrifice. So if you have a true heart of sacrifice, then the fire of God will fall. Amen. So friends, let's continue to build the numbers. Share this broadcast. This is a breakthrough broadcast. And we're going to talk about the realm of prayer. Hallelujah. We're going to talk about types of prayers that will change destinies. Amen. Because I believe that prayer not only changes you as a person, but prayer will also change the outcome of certain things that are to come. So friends of God, I want you to give us some hearts and likes. Let's boost and build up the algorithms. I know this is a funny, unusual time, but you know what? I know in the East Coast, it's a 9 p.m. Eastern Standard. In the West Coast, it's 6 p.m prime time. Someone say hallelujah. Shaka rabata. Continue to comment below where you are watching from. Give us some hearts and likes. Amen. Because in a few minutes, I'm going to begin to share the word that the Lord has placed upon my heart. Because there are prayers that will change destinies. And I believe right now we are in a key critical moment right now where the Lord is saying, I want your prayers to go up. I want your prayers to be heard. I want your prayer life to amplify and to intensify because something great is coming. There's so much more that God wants to do. So we need to prepare the grounds in prayer. We need to prepare the spiritual realm because prayer will align things. It will cause every chaotic, psychotic. It will cause every a chaotic, uh, type of situation to come into clarity and to come into alignment. So prayer will align your life to heaven. And we have to ask ourselves, are my prayers effective? Are my prayers effective? Amen. So continue to comment below. Cha, cha, cha. Sha, ta, ta. Where you are watching from, hallelujah. Rebe Sete, Shandara Bobosa. And of course, I want to be like Apostle Paul, where he says, I pray in tongues more than all of you. 
And you know what? All of you that are on here, I might be bold enough to say, I probably pray in tongues more than all of you. That is how important praying in tongues is and how important it is for us to have a prayer life. Amen. I believe prayer changes destinies. So we're going to get into this topic in a little bit. Continue to share this on your wall. Give us some hearts and likes. Praise God. Sharababarota. Sarababarota tarabata. Sandarabata. Comment below where you are watching from. I'm here in the land of Hawaii. I landed yesterday. It's good to be in the land of Aloha. And uh, definitely the Lord is taking me deeper into rest and resetting. And even for myself, some things change on my schedule, as it always does, because things happen suddenly in life. So you have to go with the flow and you also have to learn to discern what is God doing. But things began to shift. And I asked myself, should I only stay here for one week? But the Lord said, no, you need to rest because the season ahead is going to be great. So praise God, I am officially in aloha time and and in rest and reset. Hallelujah. But friends, I want to talk about the prayer that changes destinies. The prayer that changes destinies. Hello there from Barbados. South Africa, amen. Georgia Western Cape. Glory to God. Zabata, Jonestown, Pennsylvania. Oh yeah, I recognize that face. <laughs> You're one of the drunken ladies. That's right, yes. Rachel Hackman, entering the season of Pesach, the Passover season. Amen and amen. Nashville in the house. Amen, we need to pray for those in Nashville. With the horrid, horrendous shooting that took place. My goodness. And I'm telling you, a lot of these people who are in transgenderism, really in sin, okay? A lot of these people, they are spiritually tormented. And they are spiritually under attack. And we understand that the person who murdered and shot up a Christian school in Nashville, Tennessee... That person identified as a trans person. I'm telling you, friends, there is so much satanic, evil, demonic witchcraft. And these people who are identifying as trans or as homosexual, or it's really a spirit of confusion. And an evil, demonic spirit is leading people to do things that the enemy wants, which is innocent murder, which is an abomination. So we need to pray for deliverance. And I believe that's why the Lord is pushing deliverance so strong. And that's why we've been seeing an increase of deliverances across the earth. Hallelujah. Because Jesus says, I've given you authority to cast out devils. And these are not feelings or people's conscience we're talking about. These are spirits. These are evil demonic spirits. That are playing on the minds and hearts of people. Ha, shaka. So we don't talk to demons. We cast them out. We rebuke them. We bind them and we throw them back to the pit of hell. And I believe right now we're going to see a great mega move in these end times. As it was in the days of Noah. As it was in the days of Noah, we're going to see a great mega move of salvation and deliverance. Amongst those who are pedophiles, those who are, you know, groomers, those who are stuck in the spirit of Jezebel, such perversion, confusion, evil, and wickedness. <clears throat> but anyways, I want to talk about the prayer that changes destinies, the prayer that changes destinies. And if you're with me today, I want you to say amen. If you're with me today, I want you to say amen. Hallelujah. Well, praise God. I want to welcome you, friends. Let's help build the room to over a hundred today, praise God. Now today I want to talk about the prayer that changes destinies because I think we all can feel, sense and know that something great is coming. Something big is coming. And 
Of course, currently we are in the days of preparing for Pesach. We're in the days of preparing for Passover and for crossover. And uh, I believe every single one of us, we are about to cross over with seven bags of plunder, overflow, recompense in Jesus' name. But I felt to talk about the prayer that changes destinies. Because I believe we as a people of God, especially the remnant, we need to be a people of intercession. We need to be a people of effectual prayer. Okay, like I said earlier, there's a right, right way to pray, excuse me, and a wrong way to pray. There's a right way to pray and a wrong way to pray. So today, I want to discuss those things and I want to get into this. Amen. Our key verse that I want to talk about is found in James chapter 4, 15, 14 to 15, as I have pinned to the top here. And the prayer offered in faith, I want to say faith, the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who's sick and the Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Isn't that incredible? If you pray in faith, there's restoration. There's a raising up and there's a forgiveness. I want you to write that down. When you pray in faith, there's restoration. There is a raising up and there is forgiveness, okay? So there's already benefits that you see when you pray in faith. Everything you do, you must do in faith, not religiously, not rhetorically, not repetitively. It's not repetition. It's not just some kind of mundane mumbling where you become a clanging of gong and a clanging sound of cymbals, but you must do it in faith. And when you pray in faith, there's restoration and there's a raising up and there's forgiveness. If you're with me today, say amen. Now, verse 16, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for each other that you may be healed. So here the apostle James is saying what you must do if you want to receive that blessing of healing in your life, physically, emotionally, mentally. You need to confess your sins to one another, humble yourselves and pray for each other. Remember, it was Job's prayers for his three friends that restored them back. These three friends were almost like enemies, antagonizing opposing spirits. And these three friends were trying to convince Job that God was an evil God. That God, that Jehovah was not who he said he was, that he's not going to come through. He's not going to show up. He's not going to answer. He's not going to deliver. And these friends tried to convince Job. But at the end of Job's life, at the latter part of Job's life, come on. Job prayed for his friends, confession, humbling. And then they were forgiven and they received healing and breakthrough in their life. Now we continue to read the prayers of a righteous man. Ha <laughs> ha has great power to prevail, all right? The prayers of a righteous man have great power to prevail. Other translations say the prayer of the righteous are effective. They are effectual. So today we wanna to talk about the effective prayers because there's prayers that are not effective. Just because it's loud doesn't mean it's effective. Just because you pray over and over and over again and you beg God and you sir wish a lot and you're wishing upon a star, just because you vexed your soul out, it does not mean that it's effective. Can I get an amen? Okay, the prayers of the righteous are effective. So there's effective prayers and then there's prayers that are not effective. Now, let me ask you, is your prayer life effective? Is your prayer life making a mark, a dent in history and in society, is your prayer life being heard, being received, and being answered? If you're with me today, say amen. Now that word effective or effectual in the Greek is energio. And energio means energy, of course. But what energio means, it means to operate, to work, to make accomplish. I feel the Lord right now. Shakarabarabosata. Help us to get the numbers up, my friends. That word energio means to work, to be operative, to accomplish, and to work and to display. My goodness. But it's the prayers of the righteous, 
not the self-righteous. You see that? It's the prayers of the righteous. And how do you move in righteousness? Of course, it's the righteousness of Christ. But it's really through humbling oneself, confessing your sins to one another. And it's praying for one another. So it's the realm of humility and brokenness that causes you to move in the righteousness of Christ. Because we cannot pray by our own righteousness. We cannot pray. We can't, we can't even come before the Lord in our own works. The Bible says all of our works are like dirty rags. And so therefore, it's not our blood that brings us forward. It's the blood of Jesus. It's not by our stripes that we're healed. It's by his stripes we're healed. We come forward in the name of the Lord Jesus, not in the name of an apostle, of a prophet, not in the name of a ministry or denomination. It's by his name. Amen. It's him. It's the righteousness of the cross of Jesus Christ. So the prayers of the righteous are effective. So let me ask you again, are your prayers effective? Or are your prayers ineffective? And so many people get discouraged because they're looking at their life and they're not happy with what it's producing. They're looking at their life and they're not happy that there's no change. It's the same old mundane over and over, rinse and repeat. It's the same old thing. But if you want your prayers to be effective, you must move in the spirit of humility and in the spirit of righteousness. You must move in standing with the Lord. Amen. Did you know that you are seated in heavenly places? Did you know right now, right here, right now, you and I were seated in heavenly places? We are in the priesthood of Melchizedek with Jesus, with Yeshua HaMashiach. We are in the priesthood of Melchizedek, which means right now we are already in the Holy of Holies with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we are praying from the third heavens, not the first and not the second. Too many of us pray from the first or second heavens. Too many of us pray out of our flesh, out of religion, out of self-intuition or intuitiveness. We need to pray from the third heavens of where we are seated with the Lord. Are your prayers effective? Hallelujah. So here's five ways that five things that make our prayer ineffective. Five things that make our prayers ineffective. If you're ready to write notes today, say amen. And once again, give us some hearts and likes and share this on your wall. Because today I'm talking about the prayer that changes destinies. Because I believe every single one of us, we need to get our prayer life up. We need to pray the prayers of Jesus. And we need to walk in alignment with the Lord. Amen. So five things that get in the way of our prayers being effective, okay? Number one, the first thing that gets in the way is, of course, pride and self-righteousness. When you are moving in a haughty spirit or a spirit of arrogance, then the Lord will not hear your prayer. He brings the proud low and he raises up the humble. So when you are moving in arrogance and haughtiness and self-righteousness, like you are always right, like you are always uh, untouchable, you're the one who's always correct, then that's a spirit of arrogance. And the Lord will not hear you. He will not hear your prayers. So the first thing that blocks your prayers from being heard or makes your prayers ineffective, number one, it is pride and self-righteousness. Once again, we do not come before the Lord in our own strength. We come because of his love, because of his grace, because of his mercy. We come forward and we're only able to stand in the presence of a holy God because of the blood of Jesus Christ, the blood of Yeshua HaMashiach. All right, number two, the second thing that gets in the way of your prayers being heard or blocks the effectiveness of your prayers. The second thing, it is religion. And what do I mean by religion? Because religion says you have to do it a certain way. Yes, you should 
understand it as protocols of the spirit and of the kingdom. But religion causes there to be methods to prayer. Friends, there is no method to prayer. All right, we're born again in Jesus Christ, in the Holy Ghost. So what religion will do, religion says you have to go through these hoops and through these leaps and through these boxes and check and cross your T's and dot your I's in order for your prayers to be heard. And it has to be mechanical and methodological. It has to be a certain way. No, that's a lie. You have to come forward with childlikeness. You have to come forward led by the Holy Ghost in innocence and in purity. When religion and religious type of prayers begin to come forth, then at best, that becomes a mumbo jumbo. At best, that becomes clinging gongs. Are your prayers heard? Or are they ignored? Are they rejected? Because it's religious. It's what you should say, isn't it? It's what you should do. It's the right thing to do, isn't it? But your heart's not in it. Your soul is not in it. You're not feeling it. It's just a religious duty. The Lord is not into religious duty, friends. He is into heart wrenching. He is into uh, the rending of the soul. God is into genuine contrition, brokenness, and sacrifice that is laid before God. So the second thing that causes your prayers to be ineffective, it is religion. Ritualistic, methodological, mechanical, repetitive prayers. Just because you repeat a thing doesn't mean it's more powerful. Just because you say something over and over, shut up a Honda, shut up a Honda, shut up a Honda, shut up a Honda, it doesn't mean you're gonna get a Honda. Amen, this is not the law of attraction that the scientists and the Scientologists believe. Shut up a Honda, shut up a Honda, no. God is not some voodoo God, amen. So the second blockage, blocker, from your prayers to be effective, it is religion. The third blocker or the third thing that will cause your prayers to be ineffective, the third thing, it is unforgiveness. Unforgiveness, friends. When you have a heart of unforgiveness, the Bible says that he will not hear nor forgive you. You need to leave your sacrifice, your offering at the altar. And you need to make things right with your brother and sister in the Lord. You need to make things right with your neighbor. Did you know that prayer is more than words? Prayer is action. Prayer is more than words that come out of your lips. It is breath. It is spirit. Praying is spiritual. Praying is spirit to spirit. And when you pray, the spirit of God begins to bubble up that unction where now you begin to mumble or speak out his words. It's not your words. It's not some kind of good King James virgin type of words that you're trying to conjure up. No, it's his words that begin to bubble up and the unction of the Lord begins to come out of you. And that is pure prayer. But the third block is the third thing that blocks your prayers or causes your prayers to be ineffective. It's unforgiveness. Have you forgiven your neighbor? Have you forgiven your, your father, your mother, your brother, your sister? Or are you still offended? I'm telling you, friends. Repent. Repent and make things right in your heart, in your life. Hallelujah. So that the Lord will hear you. Can I get an amen? So unforgiveness, my friends. And when you have a heart of unforgiveness, you're, you are harboring bitterness. You're, you're harboring a grudge in your soul. Then that begins to block your prayers and your prayers become ineffective. If you're with me today, say amen. And give some hearts and likes or share this on your wall. Number four, the fourth thing that blocks your prayers or causes your prayers to be ineffective. The fourth thing, it is your flesh. It's your flesh. That's number four. Your flesh, because you cannot pray your will. It has to be his will. You cannot push your will 
unto the Lord. God, give me a new car. God, give me a spouse. Give me a husband. Give me a wife. God, give me a blessing. You cannot pray your impulsive nature, your own fleshly carnal desires upon God. You cannot push. That's witchcraft. That's manipulation. You cannot push yourself unto God. And that's why many people, they think God is some kind of vending machine type of God. All you got to do is put a coin in and guess what? Now you're going to get a soda. No, the devil is a liar. Stop imposing your will and using prayer to get what you want. If you want to get what you want, then that's the same thing as going to a witch or going to a warlock. But the Lord is into intimacy and trust. And he is into having a relationship with you. Therefore, in this dance of spirituality, of intimacy, he wants you to lean upon him because his burden is light and his yoke is easy. And many people are praying their flesh. Of course, God wants you to have a good car. Of course, the Lord wants you to be promoted. He wants you to be blessed. Of course, these, these are things you find in scripture. But who here knows that even atheists can quote scripture better than Christians and they use it against believers. So it's your flesh that can get in the way. Are you imposing your will unto the Lord? Are you imposing, pushing? Huh, and I'm telling you, some people are so pushy. You cannot be pushy with God. Amen. You cannot be, you know, that's like acting like an entitled child. You can't be pushy with the Lord. You can't. It's not your way or the highway. No, it's his way. And that's it. It's not God. If you don't bless me, then I'm not going to love on you. Are you kidding me? What kind of ultimatum is that? I believe, friends, in this moment, the Lord wants to remove our flesh from the equation. Our flesh when we pray. So that is number four. That's the fourth thing that blocks the effectiveness of prayer. If you're with me today, say amen. Give us some hearts and likes and help build up the numbers and the algorithm in Jesus' name. Amen. Help build up the numbers and the algorithm here. Help us to break 100 today. I guess this is not a good time for me to be on, but every time is right to talk about Jesus. Can I get an amen? All right. Now, number five, the fifth thing that causes your prayer to not work or your prayer to be ineffective, to not be accomplished. The fifth thing that causes uh, your prayers to be blocked. It is actually in action. Lack of action. Or it is being lazy. It is being a lazy hippie boy on the couch believer. Believing that God's just going to answer. No. Faith has action. Faith has works. So if you're praying then you better start moving into that thing. Otherwise, why would the Lord bless you or answer your prayer if you're being inactive? So inaction and laziness also causes you, your prayers to be inactive or your prayers to be ineffective. People think that God is just some kind of one fix it all. No, we're disciples. We need discipline which means to be discipled or to be disciplined. Listen, to be a martial artist, you need discipline. To be an Olympic gold medalist, you need discipline. To be a pro athlete, you need discipline. In order to reach levels, you need discipline. It's being a disciple of Jesus. So every single one of us, we need action in our lives. We need movement. We need to obey the Lord. And many believers think that all they have to do is pray and God will hear them. That's not true. You need to work out and walk out those prayers. And then the Lord will give to those who actually have. If you're with me today, say amen. So it's inaction. It's laziness. 
It's a spirit of entitlement. It's a spirit of being really just milking the Lord. Why would he answer? Why would he answer if you're not being serious? Why would he answer if you're not being serious? So these are five things. And of course, if I had a number six, it, it would be spiritual warfare. The reason why sometimes your prayers are not being answered is because there is warfare against your prayers. There's warfares against your prayer life. The devil is trying to block and sabotage your prayers from being answered. So when you begin to move in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, then that prayer will begin to change destinies and it will be answered from heaven because your prayers are no longer yours. It's the Lord's and the Lord begins to pray through you and the Lord begins to give you the words to speak and to say and to pray and to utter. Today I'm talking about the prayer that changes destinies. Because in the following verse here, in James 5, verse 16, the Bible talks about Elijah. And it talks about how Elijah was a man just like you and I. Amen. But he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain. He prayed earnestly. Elijah was a man just like us. And he prayed earnestly. So once again, it's showing how the greatest prophet in the Old Testament, Elijah, was a mere man, just like you and I, he had issues. He was human. He had to do human things. He had to go to the bathroom. He had to eat. He got moody, okay? He got emotional. You see clearly where he was afraid for his life and wanted to commit suicide and kill himself. So Elijah was a man just like us, but he prayed earnestly. So it doesn't show us the glory of Elijah, but it shows us the key. Pray earnestly without ceasing. Give thanks and pray earnestly without ceasing. If you want to move mountains in your life, if you want the heavens to be opened up in your life, then we must pray earnestly, pure from our hearts. We must pray with the heart of the Lord. Amen. Now, today I want to talk about the prayer that changes destinies. Because I believe right now, the Lord wants to teach us to pray. Remember, the disciples asked Jesus, teach us how to pray. The disciples did not ask the Lord to teach them how to cast out devils, how to grow a multi-mega church, how to become a multi-millionaire, how to heal the sick, how to raise it. the The disciples did not ask Jesus anything else except teach me how to pray. You have a relationship with the Father that I want. When you pray, it's different from all the Pharisees and Sadducees. And you know what? Maybe the topic or the title today on prayer, it's not that sexy for most people and maybe that's why the numbers are low right now. Because people don't want to pray. They're lazy. People don't want to pray. Or they want to pray what they want to pray. I'm sorry. You cannot just pray what you want to pray. Otherwise, your prayers may continue to be ineffective. But if you want your prayers to be heard and to be answered, then we must learn to pray the right way. God's way. We must learn to pray with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The disciples said, teach us how to pray. And of course, Yeshua said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The disciples wanted to learn to pray. prayer that changes destinies. I believe your prayer life can change your destiny. I believe your prayer life will change your destiny. 
It will change your future. Show me a man that prays. Show me a person who prays. Show me a person who prays. And I'm telling you, that person's prayer life will make more effect than having millions and millions of followers on social media. Years ago, when I was ministering to the Muslim people in Southeast Asia, the Lord told me this. He said, son, it's more important that you talk to God about people than you talk to people about God. I'm going to say that again. The Lord spoke to me and gave me a word. He said, son, it's more important for you to talk to God about people than to talk to people about God. Now, I believe we need to do the work of an evangelist. Apostle Paul said to spiritual son, always do the work of an evangelist. However, every evangelist is an intercessor because you cannot win souls on the earth without winning them in the spirit, without winning them in the heavens, because there's a spiritual battle over every single soul, over every single person. And you cannot be a true soul winner if you do not move in a spirit of intercession. That's why John Wesley, before he would go out and preach in the villages and in new regions, new lands, new territories, he would send Father Nash, a prayer warrior. Father Nash was a prayer warrior and he would send these intercessors before he went to these regions and these people would agonize in prayer and literally travail. They would travail in the spirit of moan and groan and birth in the spirit even before the man of God came into town so that when the evangelist came, boom, souls were saved in an instant. Show me your prayer life and I can show you your future. I can show you your destiny. I'm telling you, the person who prays is terrifying, is deadly. The person who prays is a weapon that is to be feared. Hallelujah. And I believe right now we are in a season where the Lord is amplifying and intensifying our prayers. Hallelujah. Our prayers. So that they will be heard, felt, seen, experienced. And that the bowls of heaven in the heavenly realms will not only be filled, but they will begin to overflow onto earth. Do you know what that means? Manifestation. Do you know what that means? Overflow tipping point. Are you ready for a tipping point in the Lord Jesus Christ? If you're with me today, say amen. Give us some hearts and likes. Here are seven types of prayer that we can find throughout the Bible. And today I'm talking about prayers that change destinies. Because if you're not happy with your life, then it's in your hands. In fact, it's in your mouth. Your future is in your mouth. I want you to catch this. Your future is in your mouth because the tongue has the power of life and death. Carabosa. So your future is held in your mouth. Your future is held on the tip of your tongue. So if you do not like what's going on in your life right now, then have you prayed about it? Are you praying? Are you declaring? Are you speaking forth the word of the Lord? So your future is in your mouth and your destiny lies on the tip of your tongue. So use it wisely. Speak wisely and do not forfeit and sabotage your future. The prayers of the righteous are effective. Are your prayers effective? Are your prayers being heard? Or is it just another mumbo jumbo? Let me tell you, friends. Some of the most, uh, all right, how do I say this? Most intercessors are interstressors. And I have seen some of the most so-called alleged prayer warriors be some of the most broke, narcissistic, self-centered, lack of cleanliness, lack of order. They are just vagabond 
prophetic Jezebels. They're just running rampant. And because they think they're intercessors or prayer warriors, their life is in shambles and there's nothing good. There's no fruits on their life today. And these prayer warriors think that they have a pass to be lazy and to be dirty. And oh, look, John the Baptist, he wore rags and he wore sheepskin and he ate locusts and grasshoppers and honey. And, and so the, he was out in the open. Listen, you're not John the Baptist. And some prayer warriors think that, you know, that allegedly they have a prayer life so they can do whatever the heck they want. <laughs> the devil is a liar. Stop living out of your car. And listen, the Lord can call you to be a traveling missionary intercessor. Absolutely. But so many people are just homeless, bum-like intercessors. There's nothing holy. Or there's nothing beautiful, glorious. There's nothing shakarabata about a homeless, bum-like Always begging and always, come on, somebody. I'm telling you, friends, you and I, there's a higher standard because the intercessors in the Old Testament, which were the priests and the Levites, man, they walked around in chic, shaka bam glory, in silk, in leather. They walked around in the finest and the best of the land. Because they represented the priesthood of Jesus. They represented the glory of God. Cleanliness is next to godliness. And I believe, friends, again, your prayer life will reflect who you are as a person. Your prayer life. It reflects who you are as a person. Shut up about that. And like I said, I'm going to say it again. Having millions of followers on social media will not have as much effect in the heavens as a person who prays. Show me your prayer life and I will show you your future. All right. I want to talk about seven different types of prayer. Seven types of prayer. If you're with me today, say amen. Is this scrum diddly umptious today? Are you enjoying and receiving? Hallelujah. Are you writing notes? Help me to break the hundred today, friends, and I'll be happier than I am today. Happier than I am right now. Amen. So here, seven types of prayer. Number one is supplication. Supplication. And what is supplication? Supplication means to ask. Okay. Now, asking prayers or supplication prayers you're asking the Lord to, uh, to bless you, to help you, to give you strength, to et cetera, et cetera. So supplication prayers are prayers of asking. And we're not asking as in we're begging. We're asking as children of God. You come to your father and you say, Daddy, I need this. I want this. X, Y, Z. And so you're coming before the Lord in a prayer of supplication. And that is the first type of prayer. And the Lord loves it when we ask. Absolutely. But we have to ask with the right heart, with the right spirit. Well, how about this? Have you asked him how he's doing today? Have you asked the Lord what he thinks? Have you asked Jesus what he thinks about you? Try that. Before he asks for something. But the Lord loves it when we ask. Because he's a good father. And he loves to give. And he loves to answer. Number two. The second type of prayer is petition. Petition. Now petition is different from supplication. Because supplication you're asking for something. But a petition is for a change in destiny. A petitioning type of prayer is a governmental type of prayer to change a destiny. It means that you are literally picketing before God. Like, you know, when protesters or rioters, when protesters are outside picketing with picket fences and with signs and with billboards, you're, you're petitioning to the Lord to change something 
governmentally, in the spirit and in the natural. So we need to have petitioning type of prayers. And that's different from supplication prayers. You, you hear even in the United States or even in your city, in your government, you want something to change, then you petition a request. You don't like the street sign in that corner. You can't just go on public, federal, governmental land and ground property and just change yourself as a citizen. No, you have to petition, petition to the higher ups, to the higher ranks. Number three, the third type of prayer is thanksgiving. When you give thanks, yes, that's worship, but it's also a type of prayer when you give thanks. Giving thanks, I believe, is one of the most powerful types of prayers because your thanksgiving will make room for you. I'm going to say that again. Your thanksgiving will make room for you. Heart and attitude of gratitude will make room for you. And when you come before the Lord giving thanks, then that literally, it like warms up his heart. It warms up his spirit. And when you come before him, just blessing him and loving on him, praising him, thanking him, blessing his name, then that opens up the gateway of glory. Your gratitude opens up the gateway to glory. That's the third type of prayer. The fourth type of prayer, it is intercession. Amen. It's intercession. And I know many of you are intercessors, but like I said, are you an intercessor or an interstressor? Because so many so-called intercessors are always stressed out. The sky is falling. The sky is falling. Oh, the devil. Oh, that Shut up. Go back into prayer because you're stressing me out. If you really prayed, then you would come out so, you would come out of the prayer closet or the prayer session. If you really prayed, then you would come out like Jesus, glowing with an afterglow of glory where you just look so calm like, shoot, he did it. Amen. I'm telling you, when you finish a prayer session, when you have when you have a, a good talk with God, a good meeting with the Lord in the courts of heaven, then you come out looking transformed and beautified, and you're glowing, and mm -mm -mm, you become irresistible. Shoo! I'm telling you, praying will make you more beautiful than all those cosmetics and beauty products and plastic surgeries of Hollywood. If you have a prayer life, that prayer life keeps your conscious clean and that prayer life keeps your soul happy. My goodness. Oh, shut up. I feel the Lord right now. <laughs> Rabba Sata. When you pray, you get filled with the Holy Ghost. And if you're not filled with the Holy Ghost, you have to ask yourself, were you really praying? Are you really praying? I remember my Bible school teacher talked about how when the guards came to get Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane, <laughs> and they were supposed to pray. And when the guards came, here comes Peter, shing, pulls out a shank and cuts off that man's ear. And my Bible teacher says, do you think Peter exercised the fruits of the Spirit? when they were meant to pray. They were supposed to pray. Could you not pray with me for another hour? Could you not pray with me an hour? And they were meant to pray, but did he exercise the fruit of the spirit? Now I'm not saying, amen, I'm not saying that, you know, defending yourself or, you know, bearing arms or against evil militaries or kingdoms, that's, I'm not saying, you can't do that and be filled with the spirit. But I just think that's very funny. Amen. So intercession. When you intercede, you're interceding with a heart of brokenness. Travail. Birthing. You're interceding. Birthing with the heart of God. Travailing. It's called agonizing prayer. When's the last time you agonized over your prodigal? 
You agonized over a region, over a nation. You agonized. I'm telling you, when, when I don't see people healed in our meetings, I go back and I'm agonized. I'm distraught. And I take it to the Lord in prayer. And I begin to pray and intercede. Because remember, intercession is to intersect with God. It means to stand in the gap. Intercession means to stand in the gap as an intercessor, intersection. And it's to stay in the middle. And it's to be that bridge, that mediator. It's to be that target that holds it all together. That's intercession, true intercession. Number five, the fifth type of prayer is declarative. It's declaration. If you decree a thing, it shall be established. And so the fifth type of prayer is declarative. So now you begin to declare the word of God. It's not even prophetic. Declaration could be, declaration could be one of the lowest forms of prophecy or, or prediction. In the realm of the prophetic, yes, you declare or you announce, pronounce. But in the realm of the prophetic of prophecy, declaration is one of the lowest because declaration itself is a realm where you are not only repeating God's word, but you're speaking it out with authority and with unction and with power. You are declaring it as the word of God. And so declaration prayers, because when you declare a thing, it shall be established. And so you need to declare God's truth, God's word over your life, over Los Angeles, over Hawaii, over the nations, the regions. Come on, you need to declare the word of God. The Bible says, I will not be sick. I will never lack a thing. The Bible says, I will never be poor. Do you see even the young lions uh, grow hungry, but those who trust in the Lord will never grow hungry. You declare the word of the Lord. You speak it out because that is your portion. So it's declarative. Prayer is declarative. And what does that mean? It's authoritative. It's not sheepish. It's not shy. It's not second guessing. It's not questioning yourself. It's not, uh, you know, holding back. No, come boldly before the throne of grace in every time of need so that you and your prayers will be heard and you shall be given what you declare. So come boldly before the word of the Lord. Come boldly, step up to the plate, batter, batter, and don't shy away. This is your moment. Come boldly before God and declare his word. Hallelujah. Declare, speak it out loud. Speak it out loud from the rooftops. What you heard in secret, what you heard him whisper, speak it out on the rooftops. You declare the word of God. Number six, the sixth type of prayer. It is prophetic. It's when you begin to prophesy the word of the Lord. And like I said earlier, declaration is one of the lowest forms of prophecy. What is prophecy in definition? Prophecy means to predict or foretell something that is to come. It's to give foreknowledge. Fore means before something happens. So prophecy is to foretell or predict something that's going to happen. And declaration is one of the lowest forms of prophecy, even though it can be prophetic. But when you have a life of prayer, you suddenly begin to get filled with the Lord and he begins to prophesy over you. He begins to say things, predict things, declare things. He begins to give you an unction of a timeline or of a date. By this day, this shall happen. By this season, by April, by May, this will happen in your life. And you begin to prophesy the word of the Lord as it comes forth, that Nabi flow, because Nabi in the Hebrew means prophet, and Nabi is one of the words of prophecy or types of prophetic anointings. And Nabi means 
river to bubble up. So Nabi is the river prophetic flow. And as that Nabi begins to flow, you begin to prophesy the word of the Lord that has not happened, that did not come to pass yet, but you will see it on earth as it is in heaven. So you prophesy. It's the prophetic. That's the sixth type of prayer. It's prophetic. That's why most prayer warriors are prophetic. They're connected to God. They're connected to the river. Most people who have a prayer life are in tune with the future. In tune with what's to come. Because you cannot trick an intercessor. You cannot trick a prayer warrior. You cannot trick somebody who has a prayer life. Hallelujah. Because prayer causes you to see. Prayer causes the hidden things to be revealed. It causes the shadows. And the things that are a mystery and hidden and darkness. To be revealed and to be exposed. Somebody said, I have a prayer life. And number seven, the seventh type of prayer. Come on, somebody. The seventh type of prayer I put is intimacy or it is listening prayer. Of course, we didn't even go into praying in tongues, which will be number eight. But the seventh type of prayer is intimacy or I like to call meditational or listening prayer. You're babbling like a Babylon. You're babbling like a pagan, but are you listening? Speak for your servant is listening. When you are in that realm of intimacy, it's not just about what you say now. And that's what most people think. People who pray think it's about what you pray. No, it's about praying out what you hear. I'm going to say that again. Prayer is about praying out what you hear. Because then you have agreement on the earth realm as it is in heaven. So praying is praying out, speaking out what you heard from God. And when you pray what you heard, then there is a witness on earth. There is an alignment from heaven on earth. And that thing begins to come to pass. Listening prayer, meditational prayer, intimacy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because when you're intimate with God, it doesn't matter about declaring or prophesying or, or petitioning. Yeah, all those things matter. Yes, have a list of people to pray for. Yes, have a list of prayer, petition, supplicate. Yes, come before the Lord. But sometimes you just come before him and you just love on him. You listen to him. You lean into him. Shock. It's not about what you do, what you say. You just lean into the heartbeat of the Father. And number eight, the eighth type of prayer is praying in tongues. And I'm telling you, we could go so deep into this. So many realms of praying in tongues. So many different realms. I realized that I actually have a drunk tongues. When I'm drunk and filled with the Holy Ghost, I have different dialects of, of heavenly tongues, heavenly languages. When I'm joyful, happy, I have different tongues. When I'm in worship, or warfare, intercession, different tongues. But number eight, the eighth type of prayer is praying in tongues. You could even sing in tongues. Amen. It's praying in tongues. And I believe praying in tongues, hear me now. I believe praying in tongues is the most important spiritual gift out of the nine gifts of the Spirit. I'm going to say that again. I believe praying in tongues or praying in other languages is the most important spiritual gift out of all the other spiritual gifts, out of the nine spiritual gifts that are listed in 1 Corinthians. Praying in tongues. Ha ha, shaka. I believe that. Because Apostle James says that your tongue is like the rudder of a ship. It may be, uh, it may be a small physical part on your body, but that thing will control your destiny or where your ship, your boat will turn in life. 
your tongue turns things around for the good or for the worse, for better or for worse. And when you pray in tongues, I believe that actually activates all the other spiritual gifts. That's why most Pentecostals believe that the number one or the first true evidence that you are truly born again or filled with the spirit is that you pray in tongues. They believe you're not truly born again. Most Pentecostal denominations believe that you are not born again if you do not pray in tongues because that is the evidence that you're filled with the Spirit as you see according to Acts chapter 2. As you see according to other examples through Scripture in the book of Acts. But praying in tongues, it is a weapon. And it is a way you protect yourself. I mean, of course, Apostle Paul says you edify your spirit, man. Edifica in the Greek, which means to build up. Like you're building up a house. You're building up a building. How tall do you want your building to be? I'm currently here at on the 22nd floor. Out of uh, 23, 4, 5 floors. I'm out of 22nd. How tall, high do you want to build your future, your life in the Lord? So praying in tongues, edifica, builds up, cha-cha-cha, grows up your life, your spirit man. Hallelujah. There are prayers that changes destinies. And I believe your prayer life can change your future, your prayer life. If you're with me today, say amen. Give us some hearts and likes. Share this on your wall. Hallelujah. The prayers that change destinies. Prayers that change destinies. Someone say hallelujah. Prayers that changes destinies. If you're enjoying this today, say amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Do you need something to change in your house, in your life? Do you need something to change right now? Well, it happens first in the spirit, not in the natural. It happens first by prayer. If you want something to change in your life, I'm telling you, friends, we're about to cross over into the month of April. Hallelujah. And we're already in Hebrew month of Nisan, which I'm going to talk about more on Thursday for the prophetic word of the month. But if you want things to change in the second quarter of 2023, then first you need to pray about it. Because everything happens by prayer. It doesn't happen happenstance, coinky dink, accidente, accidentally. It happens by prayer. And it happens first in the realm of the spirit, not in the natural. Friends, as we're about to cross over into April and we're literally two weeks away, hallelujah. We're literally, wow, one week away from Passover, one week away from Pesach. And of course, Resurrection Sunday, or otherwise known as Easter, is April 9th. But we are one week away from Passover, friends. So get ready for the greatest transition of your life. And you and I, we need to pray, be prayed up, be aligned. And we need to be ready for this quick move out of Egypt. Because the Lord says, you're about to move out quickly. You're about to move up quickly. You are about to move out quickly for this is going to be a quick move, a shift and a quick change in your life. If you believe it, say amen. Now give me some hearts and likes, share this on your wall if you enjoyed this today. My goodness. I want to say one more thing because I grew up in a Korean home and us Koreans know how to pray. My parents went to early morning prayer almost every day growing up. Every day from 
Tuesday to Saturday, went to church and prayed corporately, dedicating their first fruits to God at 4 or 5 a.m. every day. Tuesday to Saturday, my whole life. That's how real Koreans do it. And I grew up in that, but I realized that as righteous and as holy as that may seem to be, many times it seemed ineffective. I want your prayers, God wants your prayers to be effective. In fact, the Lord wants you to enjoy praying to him and praying with him. Again, you can pray to him or you can pray with him. You can pray to him or pray with him. You can talk to me or talk with me. Very different. But I believe, friends, Konnichiwa is not Korean. But I believe, friends, we are in a season right now where nations are going to turn back to God. Regions are going to gather to pray. Meet me at the flagpole. I'm telling you, the spirit of prayer is going to come upon many people. Shata. And they're going to pray in the name of Jesus. Not the name of Allah, Buddha, Muhammad, Hare Krishna. They're going to pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The spirit of prayer. Hallelujah. Lift up your hands. I want to pray for you. Lord, I thank you for our friends today. I ask you, would you bless them? Release an impartation of prayer. Friends, if you enjoyed today's broadcast, I want you to say amen. Give some hearts and likes. I pray for an impartation of prayer. The disciples asked the Lord, teach us how to pray. God, teach me how to pray. Teach me how to pray. Teach us how to pray. Teach us to be a praying people because the Father's house is a house of prayer. And Lord, I thank you that this is a season where we're going to see mountains move and giants fall. We're going to see some of the most catastrophic, yet some of the most historic changes in all of history and all of society. The nations of the earth will not only shake and tremble, but the nations are turning to Jesus one by one by one by one. So Lord, I thank you for the fire of God. And I thank you that the prayers of the righteous are effective. So Father, I pray for effectual prayers. Anoint our lips, our minds. Anoint us so that we will pray effectual prayers that will change destinies, change the future. And Lord, I thank you that now you are filling your people with the spirit of God to pray like never before. So thank you, Lord, for all that you did today. In your name we pray, amen. Someone say hallelujah. Glory to God. Look at that. We almost made the 100 mark today. For whatever reason, we could not break 100, but it's all right. Well, friends, God bless you. I am here in Oahu. And uh, Wednesday and Thursday, tomorrow, Thursday, I'm ministering here in Oahu, Honolulu area. So come and see me. Friday, Saturday, I'll be ministering in Hilo. Sunday morning, I'll also minister in Hilo. Sunday evening, I'll be ministering in Kona, Hawaii. Friends, I love you. God bless you. Aloha from Hawaii, the kingdom, the nation of Hawaii. And uh, the Lord bless you. So thanks for watching. Give us a heart and a like and a follow if you enjoyed today's teaching. Consider sharing this broadcast. And uh, also follow me on Instagram. YouTube, TikTok, and even here on Facebook. Thank you, everybody. Bless you. Love you. This is one of your favorite prophetic voices, Dr. Pastor Ben Lim. God bless you. Until next time.